we were actually we had just finished this slide which is about how to get channels from other owners other owners um so we are on uh, slide number 13.21 um the key to remember from the previous one is there is cbp protocol cbp is the coexistence beacon protocol coexistence beacon protocol and cpe is um, the customer premises equipment right so cpe is like your computer uh, or or something else you know it could be a home antenna or something like that right so this is cpe uh, a cpe sends a cbp with channel contention request so one thing we noticed that um, Uh, in 802.22 much of the work is done by the customer reason they do much of the work is because they are at the edge and they know better about what's happening in the neighboring cell than the than the base station and so cpe sends a beacon with channel contention request which says that i want to get this channel channel number 2 whatever the channel is and the cc request the channel contention request contains the id of the source and the destination operator and the bs ids base station ids so it basically sends to the neighboring uh, base station and then um, and if it succeeds then it sends a success response back to its own base station saying that okay you can you can uh, i think we 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 won this we can use this channel and uh, then the contention source sends the cc act to the indicate that is going to use that channel so basically then it announces the base station announces that we can use the channel so basically the summary is that these 802.22 networks will be changing channels will be trying to find the channel continuously dynamically as they become available or get occupied by their or their original owners so this is also known as by the way this is also known as cognitive networks cognitive networks means they they um they can change their channels depending upon basically they can recognize the i mean they are let's see cognitive means two things first of all it means that they can change the channel which many other networks can do but also they they can work on many different frequencies right because in the older networks the frequency was fixed so if you had a 2.4 gigahertz network it could not work on any other frequency other than 2.4 gigahertz but these um, 802.22 based networks will be able to work on many different frequencies and some of them will use a technology called SDR SDR is software defined radio um and um software defined radio means that you do all the frequency related work in the software rather than in hardware and that way you can adjust to any frequency right now most of the work in related to the frequencies is, is done in the hardware so the antenna obviously is hardware but everything after the antenna is hardware which they have filters and things like that those are all hardware filters later on i mean they will be all software So anyway, this is a protocol. AODC is the adaptive on-demand channel contention process protocol, which basically says if a channel is available, then how do you decide that you can use it? You basically announce that I want to use it, and if the neighbors all agree, then you can go ahead and use that ch channel. Now, if there are two two cells which want to get the same channel, so there are some simple rules. Uh, first is if the two cells belong to the same operator both of them are AT&T obviously they are not going to fight and um, the way they will resolve is by flipping a coin and coin flipping means they will draw a random number and uh, whoever gets the higher number wins right um the if they are from different operators 
then um, there is a little bit more than just flipping a coin. And in this case, um, there is some kind of bidding, which is, um, it, so there is a, it says, okay, I, am, I want to bid, you know, so many credit tokens. And everybody has so many tokens that they can only spend. If you bid too much, your credit tokens are out. And so you bid certain number of tokens, depending upon how, how much you need that channel. And, um, and the other person also bids, bids the same uh, credit tokens. And whoever wins uh, more tokens, wins. Whoever bids higher, wins. So it's, like it's, 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 um, it's more like a soft bidding where the credit tokens are certain amount. It's like real, it's like not real money, but it's, it's like money where if you run out of it, then you cannot use your um, system for a long time. Now, again, I don't know how much of this is going to be used in practice, though. I mean, this is all in the standard, but um, we'll see when it really becomes a reality. Okay, so so much about to getting the channel. But if you use the same channel as the neighbors, which you can, so it's like channel two here in St. Louis and channel two in some other town next door, then you have to use the same, if you use the same frequency, then you have to synchronize the, tra synchronize the transmission. Synchronize means your upstream has to be exactly the same time as your neighbor's upstream and your downstream has to be the same time as your neighbor's downstream. Anybody remembers why that would be the case? Because uh, the base is much more powerful Yeah, right. Because the base are very much powerful, they will just drown out the CPEs, and therefore um, this, um, even though they might be on FDD or whatever it is, not TDD, but they have to synchronize. All right. Um, a spectrum sensing function. So both base station and CPEs um, uh, figure out what spectrum is available. And um, so base station might send a, a request to CPE saying that, can you figure out if channel two is available? And, um, and CPE will just respond back, yeah, I, I don't hear anybody on channel two. So that is straightforward. And then there is a geolocation database, which means that a database is available, which tells exactly what channels are being used in what locations. And um, so if you know your GPS location, then you can figure out at this longitude, at this latitude, channel two is being used by you know, whoever is using it. Um, and so that is what is geolocation database is. It is GPS based, CPS send their GPS coordinates and, um, and then basically um, they can use the database. But the way it is described here is ranging is done between the BS and CPEs. BS can also ask their CPEs to listen to ranging and determine their distances from a CPE. So, um, if the CPEs, sorry, there are two choices, I suppose, here. One is the GPS-based choices, where CPEs knows their, know their GPS, and many of the, for example, CPEs today know GPS. Um, iPhone has GPS built in. Many of the other phones have GPS built in, so they know that. If they don't know it, then you do it by ranging, and you can do the ranging with the BS, and you can do ranging with the other CPEs. And that's new in the sense that to know your exact location, um, basically you need uh, two or three reference points. So you measure the distance from one point, you measure the distance from second point, and if you know the distances, you can find out wh where you are, at least in the two-dimensional plane, you can draw two circles and you can figure out where you might be. You need a third one to really figure out exactly where you are in two dimension, and so on and so forth. So you need many CPEs to, to find the range, uh, your distance, and then you can figure out your location. So if one says that I am at this lang latitude and longitude, the base station says I am at this lang latitude and longitude, and then you know from other CPEs, then you can figure out exactly where your location is. And this 
system is used actually I don't know whether they use with the CPEs but they use with the base stations you can measure your distance from multiple base stations and you can know exact location and this system is used for 9-11 I mean um, for 9-11 calls so right now in the United States and I'm sure in other countries as well there is a requirement if somebody calls from a cell phone a 9-11 number then um, the cell phone company has to tell exactly where this person is to the police right and so they, the way they figure out is by this ranging business okay that brings us to the end of 802.22 summary is that it is a regional area networks it covers a large distance generally for rural areas using unused tv channels and so much of the standard is devoted to just determining what is unused and how to move from one channel to the next much of it is very similar to 802.16 um, in terms of the other physical layer stuff OFDMA, upstream, downstream, TDD, FDD, all of those things are very similar, the framing. The main new stuff is the CBP, the coexistence protocol. And, um, and you have to periodically sense whether the channel has come back up every few milliseconds actually. And then uh, if the channel has, if the operator has come back up, then you move. Um, multiple um, networks can coexist in the same area on the same channel by using coexistence methods. Um, when they say coexist in the same area on the same channel, um, it doesn't mean um, exactly at the same location in the similar in the neighboring cells rather. Um, and then spectrum sensing, sharing, and renting rules. We talked about those. You could rent a channel from uh, uh, from the other people who are occupying the channel, and then adaptive on-demand channel contention. So we, that was the last protocol that we talked about. AO, AODCC, adaptive on-demand channel contention, which was basically you ask the CPE or the uh, yeah CPE to to request that the channel 2 is uh, going that we are going to use anybody has a problem with that if nobody has a problem with that then you just go ahead and use channel 2 or whatever channel you want to use so that's 802.22 any questions about that anything I do have a paper which I want to distribute next time and um, we actually had the whole we actually have the whole standard also and i think last time we made the students um, read the whole standard the standard is a little bit big it's like 500 pages long um the advantage of reading the standards is this just get used to what the standards look like although they are very unreadable um i mean they but that is our life basically those of us who work on these things have to read those standards they're very precise they're written like legalese so that's why I, I used to make people read that i'm not sure so i will have this paper next time and this would give you some ideas so this paper actually i just found out so i don't if you don't have it on your on your slides um, but i will give it to you so you will basically have a copy of it um the standard we have it is 516 pages long and and then there's a 22 and there's a 22.1 um which also we have but i'm not sure whether it is worthwhile putting it out so then the homework is actually then not due because homework depends upon the standard homework requires reading the standard and drawing a flow chart which is actually very similar to the flow chart in the standard however um, so I will have to get, get, get basically based upon that paper I will have to find make another homework next time I will give you a paper and a homework okay um, these Wikipedia articles um, have some information about um, 802.22 although information is very limited and um, then there is an article on dynamic frequency hopping on cognitive radio and white spaces which are all very related to this topic 
and from now on every lecture we have put the list of acronyms at the end so this also has in you know is, is all the acronyms that have, we have used in this lecture uh, that's the end i suppose um, so unless let's see if there are any questions we're back to here By the way, standard is not done yet. That's why we have not seen any deployments. Um, if you notice here, this is D2, draft two. And this is dated May 2009. So the draft two came out in May 2009. And so it has um, basically is still in the committee Generally what happens is they will have draft 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 or whatever number and then it will go into uh, sponsor ballot and I am a member of the sponsor ballot so then I, that is almost the time when the standard is done from the committee and then it goes to people outside the committee and we read it and we say okay it's fine uh, and then it becomes a standard so this is not a standard yet it is I mean looking at the things as they are uh, you can see that it will be at least a year before the blue chemist standard. Um, and this is in D6. The second part is also D6. So this is a draft 6. Okay. If not, then we move on to the next lecture, which is 21.